Gordon is the uh, CEO of the Care Not Killing Alliance in the, in the UK. Uh, he, so he's involved in Scotland, the UK, Ireland, uh, issues related to euthanasia and assisted suicide in a very similar way as, you know, I, I work here in Canada and, uh, and in other places. Uh, Gordon has been a leader for many, many years, and um, but uh, it's 11 o'clock, 11.02, and I'm going to move it straight over to Dr. McDonald. If he wants to say more about himself, he's free to do so. Well, thank you, Alex, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I would say at the start that I'm not a medical doctor. I've got a PhD, so um, I wouldn't want anyone to, to think that I was presenting myself as an expert in medicine, although my wife is a, a general practitioner. Um, let me just get this up. So what I want to talk to you about today is what's been happening in the in the UK and also a bit more around Europe. Some of some of the material we've already covered, but um, I'm, I'm speaking at it really from the point of view of, as a campaigner um, and also hoping to shed some insights um, uh, as to how we would argue against the, the pressure that we are under. Um, particularly perhaps from a, a medical perspective um, engaging in the in the political sphere. So the first thing is just to understand the motivation of those who argue for euthanasia. Um, at the root of their position is a, a radical view of autonomy and individual freedom, um, the desire for control, the fear of the loss of dignity, um, avoidance of suffering, often psychological or emotional suffering, um, and a desire not to be a burden on friends, family, care services, etc. Certainly, the fear of physical pain or experience of physical pain um, is is not one of the main reasons that people seek either euthanasia or assisted suicide. The dangers of euthanasia and assisted suicide are well known, I'm sure, to many of you. But just to, to recap, pressure on vulnerable people. We've already heard about that um, from Annette. Annette, um, particularly emphasizing those who have got um, psychiatric or psychological issues, but there are, there are other people who are vulnerable as well, who don't have those particular problems. Um, elder abuse, abuse within families um, or within institutions. We see increasing numbers in every jurisdiction where assisted suicide or euthanasia has been legalized. We see cases of euthanasia without explicit consent having been obtained, particularly in relation to dementia patients potentially. Um, we see a slippery slope and the slippery slope is real. It, it is primarily focused on the extension of the criteria to include other conditions. Uh, I'll come on to that again later. We see a change in the medical culture and in the doctor patient relationship and also in the nurse patient relationship. Um, and I think this is the most concerning thing really from my perspective as a as somebody who is engaging in politics, looking at it from an ethics point of view, someone who's got a, an interest in history, it's the, it's the change in the medical culture and then the wider culture throughout the whole of society. And we've seen some of that um, in relation to the response to the COVID pandemic in the UK, particularly um, attitudes towards people in care homes uh, where uh, uh, they, they haven't had the same sort of access potentially to healthcare as, as others, um, but it's, it's more of a mentality of saying, well, there's not much we can do for them in any case. And we see this even today in, the, in one of the papers, we have a broadcaster, a retired broadcaster, one of the leading broadcasters on the BBC for many years, um, essentially saying that people's lives are not all worth the same um, and that this is um, that we should recognize this and legalize assisted suicide as a result. Um, the, we see the normalization of suicide um, where death is seen as a solution for any form of unbearable suffering. Now, as you can see, probably my, my screen is about to go off in five minutes. So I'm going to switch it off and switch it back on again um, to avoid that happening. And hopefully that will resolve that problem. Uh, where is assisted suicide or euthanasia legal? Seven US states, um, if you include Montana, as has been said, that's eight, um, and the District of Columbia, Switzerland, um, various other countries around Europe, Canada, some states in Australia, um, euthanasia only in Belgium, and where are the threats? Well, there's a threat in the UK, um, 
an ongoing threat in the UK, which so far we've managed to defeat. And Tasmania is debating it at the moment. Um, Jersey in the Isle Channel Islands um, is considering whether to have a citizens' assembly or not. Italy, Portugal, Spain, and Spain are fairly advanced in terms of the legislative process to legalise euthanasia. There's a bill in Ireland, and in both Germany and Austria, courts have ruled that um, laws prohibiting assisted suicide are unconstitutional. At Westminster, uh, we have a history going back to the um, early turn of the century, um, with three bills were brought forward by Lord Joffe. Um, Baroness Finlay, who's, who's on the um, call today, has been intimately involved in resisting the bills in the House of Lords for many, many years. We had a coroner's and justice bill in 2009, which there was an attempt to amend to introduce assisted suicide. Lord Faulkner, the former, Tony Blair's former um, senior law officer, sought to, to bring in a bill in 2014. Um, Rob Maris, a Labour MP, brought a bill before the House of Commons in 2015, which was defeated. And just in the last um, year or two, we've seen two debates in the House of Commons um, being brought forward, calling for a government inquiry into assisted suicide as a precursor to um, a bill being brought forward. There was, of course, a, an inquiry in Australia, in, in, uh, in one of the states in Australia, which was launched. And then following the conclusion of that inquiry, there was legislation introduced. Um, and then in January this year, um, the UK health minister said that he was asked if he would consider collecting data on suicides of terminally ill people um, who um, don't go to Switzerland, but who are you know, committing suicide in the UK. And he indicated that he would consider doing so in order to inform the next parliamentary debate. So you can see the pressure is constant. And we have an all part of parliamentary group. Um, the members of whom have indicated that they want to see a private member's bill to change the law in the UK within two years. The Scottish Parliament, the proposal was first considered in 2006. Um, it didn't get enough support to be taken forward as a bill. But then we had a euthanasia bill in 2010, which was heavily defeated. Um, I think it was about 86 votes to 16 or something, around about that, as I recall. The, the member who brought that forward introduced another bill. Um, she sadly passed away and so another member took it over. But that second bill was an assisted suicide bill and it was defeated in 2015. Um, and since the election in 2016, we've had a cross-party group of parliamentarians. They are planning to bring forward a bill, a consultation and a bill. Um, and their current proposal is to bring forward a consultation and a bill after the election later this year. So our current threats, both at Westminster and in the Scottish Parliament, are bills which will probably be fairly narrow in their criteria, their eligibility criteria, applying to people who are terminally ill, with a prognosis of six months or less to live, resident in Scotland or the UK. However, it's interesting that since there has been debate in Australia and in Ireland and in, in uh, Spain and Portugal, those people who are who normally have argued for us a, uh, a narrow bill with six months or less to live and only applying to ass uh, assisted suicide rather than euthanasia have started to cite the developments elsewhere where euthanasia bills um, have been brought forward often with with no term limit in terms of prognosis um, and then the other aspect applying to the uk at the moment is the bill in the in ireland which applies to all residents of the island of Ireland, including those in Northern Ireland um, who have lived for, there for 12 months. And that opens up the possibility of suicide migration from other parts of the UK, where people might move to Northern Ireland for 12 months in order to access euthanasia, euthanasia in the Republic of Ireland. So in terms of the, the figures in the Commons, the last time it was voted on in 2015, Essentially, there was about 54% or so voted against the bill, about nearly 20% voted for the bill, um, and a, a, a significant percentage there, as you can see, that either were not present or abstained. Uh, 
clearly there's been quite a few elections since then, so the, the situation in Parliament will have changed a lot. My feeling is that we probably still have a majority in the House of Commons in opposition to the bill, um, and certainly our opponents are not currently seeking to bring forward a bill because I think they know that, that they would struggle at the moment to, to get something through the House of Commons. But we can't be complacent. We have to be conscious of the fact that there are an awful lot of MPs who have not voted on this issue before, they haven't considered this issue. Um, and we have a constant job in terms of briefing newly elected members of the dangers of legalising assisted suicide or euthanasia. In the House of Lords, there was a bill debated, brought forward by Lord Joffe and voted on in 2006. Um, that vote, as you can see, was closer than the Commons vote in 2015. Um, a large number of the peers were not present. Since then, the, the number of peers has increased. In fact, it's, it's higher than, than the figure for 2020 or will be shortly because there's a number of new peers being created by the government um, as they seek to try and redress the the political balance in the House of Lords. In the Scottish Parliament in 2010, there was about 66% or so um, opposed to the euthanasia bill. Um, the numbers for it were very small, but uh, they were su suppressed partly because there was a, a snowstorm, a blizzard, and many of the MSPs um, took that opportunity either not to attend or could not attend obviously with a controversial bill being debated, there was a very high absence rate. In 2015, the numbers were more as we would have expected them to have been. Um, and so you can see again that the level of opposition was largely um, the same, but the level of support had, had more or less doubled, increased um, substantially from the previous time. So our plan is to launch a new campaign um, this year ahead of the elections. Um, to try and inform um, MSPs, candidates of the dangers of euthanasia and encourage people to contact their candidates. And that's not currently live, but if any of you are interested, you can check back in a month or so's time and, and hopefully you might be able to see that campaign. Just to summarise, the World Medical Association did reiterate its opposition to assisted suicide and euthanasia just last year. It's important that we, we keep reminding our own medical associations and our own politicians of that, that, the, the, that what we're seeing is not the norm in terms of world medical practice. Um, and the fact that there are people who are very vocal um, in our own society should not be seen as being the determining factor. And Professor Raymond Tallis, who's one of the leading proponents of euthanasia assisted suicide laws in the UK, who had, has had a very senior position, has stated, I believe that we shall bring these bodies round to an appropriate stance of neutrality and that with this obstacle removed, Parliament may indeed come to support legislation in favour of assisted dying. We did see this in Canada, of course, uh, where the CMA went neutral before the law was changed. Um, and this is the danger that medical bodies going neutral um, send a signal to parliamentarians and it's really important that doctors who are opposed to assisted suicide or euthanasia do engage with their medical bodies to make the case uh, of opposition. So we've had three surveys this year in the UK, the Royal College of Physicians, sorry in the last two years, the Royal College of Physicians were the first. Um, they asked their membership what the position of the college should be on assisted dying as they just called it which really was assisted suicide. They set a bar of 60%, um, a 60% super majority to retain the college's opposition. Um, initially they were proposing 66%, but that was reduced to 60%. Um, so clearly from the outset, it was going to be difficult to retain the opposition of the college. In fact, the results were 43.4% felt the college should be opposed. 31.6% wanted the college to support assisted suicide and 25% wanted neutrality. Um, despite the fact that the option of neutrality received the least support, it was um, the position that the college moved to. But roughly 81% of palliative care doctors who responded were supporting opposition. 
The Royal College of Ge General Practitioners also conducted a survey. Um, the numbers are not that different in terms of the percentages, uh, slightly different. Uh, the largest minority still want opposition from the college, uh, slightly more wanted um, support from the college, and a smaller number were in favour of neutrality. And on that basis, the Council of the College, college decided that they would remain opposed. Um, so just because there wasn't a 50% um, level of support for opposition, they still decided that they would remain opposed. And that is very contrast quite substantially with the decision making in the Royal College of Physicians. British Medical Association is the, the third one. It is the most significant um, vote, I think. Um, it will, it, the result of that and the decision making that follows it will have the most impact. Throughout most of its history, it's been opposed to euthanasia. There was a, a, a one year period where it adopted neutrality at the annual representative meeting. Um, and then since then, every year there have been motions at the annual representative meeting and the decision was always to reject changing the position. However, in 2019, the motion, a motion was put forward to ballot the membership. And that's not the usual way that the British Medical Association would make policy decisions. Um, but on this occasion, it was agreed that that was what would happen. So in 2020, they consulted their members and they're due this year to consider the results of the poll, although the, the annual representative meeting has just been postponed and will be online again this year. So it may be that they may postpone the debate um, till next year because they chose last year not to debate the results of the poll because it was an online meeting. So the BMA's position in terms of the results of the poll, as you can see there, were very different from the other college, the, the two colleges, because on assisted suicide, most of those who responded were either, um, well, not most, but the largest minority were for the BMA supporting assisted suicide. Um, and uh, the neutral position was quite high. Um, in euthanasia, the figures were um, a little bit different. Um, clearly, there's more willingness to consider support for assisted suicide than there is for euthanasia. And the BMA, I would say, is, is, has a reputation of being a bit more socially liberal than, than some of the other medical institutions. What can we conclude from the BMA poll results if we dig down into them a bit further? Um, the first thing isn't a huge surprise, I suppose. The closer to the issue as somebody works, the further they are from support. So 70% of palliative care respondents um, uh, wanted the BMA to oppose a change in the law. Only 7% wanted the BMA to support a change in the law on physician assisted suicide. And 79% wanted the BMA to oppose um, euthanasia. 76% uh, uh, were personally opposed to physician assisted suicide. And 83% um, said um, that they were personally opposed to euthanasia um, and 76% were unwilling to engage in physician assisted suicide and 84% were unwilling to administer euthanasia. If you look at other specialties um, who, uh, where, where the, the doctors would be dealing with people towards the end of their lives, in general practice um, you can see that uh, the, the, the figures in yellow are those who are opposed, the, the figures in white there are those who indicated support, that the, the BMA should support a change in the law. So there was a larger number of GPs in uh, favouring opposition than support, same with geriatrics, same with the respiratory. Um, but the per and in terms of personal opposition, again, they were, they were quite high figures. The strongest support, on the other hand, comes from specialties where people are not generally dealing with those who are approaching the end of life, such as anesthesia, um, sexual health, medicine, obstetrics and gynaecology, etc. The second conclusion you can come to from the BMA poll results are that the least cautious are those who are no longer practicing or who are yet to enter practice. Um, so retirees and medical students made up 20% of the respondents um, and uh, the figures there for 
um, BMA supporting a change in the law. You can on assisted suicide, you see there are 50% of retirees, 53% of medical students. So when politicians are considering the BMA poll results, they should bear in mind, at least we would argue, that a significant percentage of those who are most enthusiastic are not those who are currently engaged in practice. Um, and that it would be helpful to, to look at the views of those who are currently engaged in practice. But clearly, there is some work to be done from our perspective, particularly in relation to medical students. And then the third conclusion, wanting your profession to push for assisted suicide without being willing to assist yourself personally. Only 73% of those who wanted support, the BMA to support, and only 68% were pers who, of those who were personally in favour were willing to participate themselves. Um, only 69% of those who wanted the BMA to support euthanasia and only 64% of those who were personally in favour were willing to participate in terms of administering euthanasia. So the BMA should be guided by the specialists who are closest to the care for and support of dying people. Um, and 47% of those registered to practice were not willing to participate and 19% were unsure and only 34% of those registered to practice were willing to participate. So what will happen if the law changes? There'll be a duty on doctors um, to inform their patients about assisted suicide and the doctors will come under pressure um, to participate. There is a couple of responses to that. One is this group called CADL, um, which is seeking to um, try and reach out to the middle ground um, of doctors who are not opposed in principle but don't want to participate themselves. Um, we are trying to set up our, we're relaunching a group called Our Duty of Care, um, which is um, essentially trying to take a position of um, mobilizing people to oppose within the medical profession to oppose um, euthanasia and that website um, is now live. Um, the key arguments then against euthanasia, um, there's the issue of vulnerability, there's the issue of the fact that there's very low demand um, and there's the issue of the fact that the current law works well, it tempers, tempers justice and mercy. So first of all, vulnerable people feel under pressure. Uh, we've, we've covered that already today. I'm not gonna go into a, a great deal, um, but it's well known that it's easy for people to either be under pressure themselves, feel put pressure on themselves or, or come under pressure from other people. And autonomy means that where you create rights for one group of people, you imply duties for others and in particular duties on doctors to provide um, uh, for the demands of, of those who wish to access assisted suicide or euthanasia. Free requests are not always truly freely made. Rights granted to some people undermine rights of other people and there are always limits in, of, to freedom in any democratic society. There's a conclusion from a select committee back in 1994 was that it was impossible to prevent um, people from coming under pressure. Um, and that still stands as uh, the most substantial parliamentary investigation of the issue um, in the UK. The Scottish First Minister has also echoed these views herself, bo both times we've had debates in the Scottish Parliament, that she is personally concerned. She wouldn't be a social conservative at all, but she is still nevertheless personally concerned about the issue of pressure being applied to people. And we have, of course, the issue of funding, the finances. So a couple of Scottish academics published a report last year in which they highlighted the potential uh, fact that financial savings and organ donation um, are factors which need to be considered in the debate, although they did say that they weren't arguing for legalization of euthanasia or assisted suicide on those grounds but they were drawing attention to these aspects of the debate which are often overlooked. Second the slippery slope is inevitable um, we've already seen some of that in the earlier talk 
um, how it expands from from diff one group from terminally ill to chronically ill adults to children etc mentally competent to the mentally incompetent and so we see an increase in numbers we see that it spreads to new categories of people we see a change in the public conscience and in the medical culture and if you look at this slide you see how the numbers have gone up in the in four jurisdictions the netherlands is at the forefront of, of increases in numbers but the others are not far behind interestingly enough oregon in the usa um, has had the least increase in numbers um, in terms of um, uh, assisted suicide deaths per thousand people I'm not going to go into Oregon greatly because we're, we're having a talk about it later, but, I, but it does interest me how the fear of being a burden has increased as a reason over the years since 1998, um, from 13% up to 59% in 2019 as a reason that it has been cited by those seeking assisted suicide. Um, in Belgium, we've seen similar increases in numbers as you've seen already. You've seen instances of um, doctors and indeed nurses conducting euthanasia without having obtained consent, a significant percentage. Um, increases in the number of involuntary cases, under-reporting under and unreporting of cases. Um, there is euthanasia for, with organ donation attached to it uh, in, the, in, in Belgium, euthanasia for children. And there's a new law um, which requires doctor referrals by doctors and also limits the freedom of association of religious care homes and hospitals. In the Netherlands, 4% or, or slightly over of all deaths are classified as euthanasia. Um, more than 25% of deaths are induced in some form um, through continuous deep palliative sedation in most cases. Um, and clearly palliative sedation happens in all jurisdictions. But the interesting thing about the Netherlands, I think, is the way it has been increasing over the years, which I'll come on to a slide in a minute. Where euthanasia was legalised in 2001-2002, it was claimed it would reduce backdoor euthanasia and stop extension. Um, yet it's been extended um, from the terminally ill to the chronically ill, to include disabled infants. Um, psychiatrically ill patients etc and there are even proposals uh, there was a report put before the Dutch Parliament last year to extend it to over 55s and there's a consideration currently going on in the in the Dutch political sphere about children aged 1 to 12. So there's the growth of continuous deep terminal sedation in the Netherlands um, from 5.6% to in 2001 to 22.6% in 2017. There's a growth of euthanasia for psychiatric conditions in the Netherlands. Uh, obviously, we've got had the 2019 figure already mentioned. Um, and Professor Tail Bohr says, said in a, a paper, the assumption that euthanasia will lead to lower suicide rates is not supported by the numbers. He quotes there the increase in euthanasia rates and also the increase um, in suicide rates in the Netherlands. And we had Tail speak to parliamentarians in the UK on World Suicide Prevention Day on the 10th of September. And I do think that this is a day that we can um, use to advance our arguments and we should be seeking to do that in those jurisdictions where this is a live issue. Um, Baroness Finlay, a quote from Baroness Finlay um, back in 2010. And the symptoms can be relieved through good palliative care. And it's important that we always repeat that message, and particularly to politicians, to, and help politicians also to understand what palliative care is like. So if you run a hospice, I would encourage you to invite your elected representatives to come and visit the hospice and see palliative care in action. Finally, the law acts as a strong deterrent it leads to discretion in sentencing, discretion in prosecuting, and it has a stern face but a kind heart. So if you take the UK in the period 2002 to 2019, there was an average of 25.3 people each year who committed suicide at Dignitas in Switzerland. Um, in the Netherlands, there was an average in the same period of 3,806 people 
who died by euthanasia, which equates to 15,224 deaths in the UK, um, if you compare the population size of the UK and the Netherlands. The for reference, the, the similar equivalent there for Oregon is put there because that, that has an assisted suicide law, which clearly Dignitas is in Switzerland, which has an assisted suicide law. And so you see it would be 85.1 on average in Oregon and 1,350 UK equivalent. So conclusions, medical opinions divided, but those who work most closely with the elderly and dying are overwhelmingly opposed to assisted suicide and euthanasia and neutrality is the least favoured option. Neutrality on the part of medical bodies and doctors will influence the public debate and be used to pressurise politicians to change the law. It's important that doctors who oppose assisted suicide and euthanasia contact politicians to inform them about the dangers of changing the law. We need to engage with the media by identifying spokespeople, writing op-eds, letters, etc. We need to improve our social media campaigning, it's vital. Parliamentary elections are crucial, so we need to engage with candidates ahead of elections and afterwards with the newly elected members. And then longer term, education of medical students and junior doctors is, is absolutely crucial to winning the battle. Um, and it's an area that we should not be overlooking. Thank you. Any questions? Are there any, yeah, are there any specific questions for uh, for Gordon McDonald? In Canada, I've, I've been advertising, promoting. Yeah, okay. There were a couple questions about what happened with the RCP, and I think that's important. A lot of controversy about what happened at the RCP was mentioned by uh, by Miriam, and I know you spoke about it. Uh, do you have anything more you want to say about that, uh, Gordon? Well, clearly there was a, a, an attempt or a proposed judicial action, a legal case being brought against the RCP that was ultimately settled out of court. And the RCP issued a clarification that they um, did not support a change in the law. Um, you can see that on their website. Um, I think the, the concern about the RCP was that in terms of the process was that they, essentially they decided in advance not only to have the 60% um, threshold in order to retain the status quo, whereas normally you would have a, uh, in any organization where you were considering a fundamental change of position and you were going to have a super majority, it would be the other way around. You would say we need a two thirds majority um, or whatever to change the position, not to keep the position that we've always had or certainly had for a long time. Um, but the other concern about the RCP was that they had decided ahead of conducting the poll um, what conclusion they would come to if that 60% majority wasn't met, um, which was that they would go neutral. And as you saw from the figures, the neutrality was the least favoured option. The questions therefore were being asked about um, whether or not that was an appropriate for a charitable organisation to be um, in terms of its governance and clearly that was the issue which ultimately was settled um, out of court. Very good. Now um, we have five new messages here. Okay. You and the Care Not Killing organization have been extremely effective at stopping the pressure to embrace assisted dying. Could you describe what you think has been the most effective strategy? Well the most effective strategy has to be constituents speaking with their elected representatives, particularly those who have experience of palliative care, um, for particularly doctors. Um, in the Scottish context, which I can speak on because I was leading the campaign opposing the two bills in Scotland, we had a very effective coalition. We had a, a large number of people sit writing to their MPs or their MSPs, I should say. Um, we had doctors who were involved. We had you know, a range of people with disability rights activists who were involved. It wasn't being run as, as a religious campaign, although that's what our opponents were saying. It was a broad coalition and, and that's the key really. The key is that it's our broad coalition who are arguing on grounds of public safety, issues of vulnerable people. And the thing which I find really interesting about this 
uh, engaging with politicians on this issue is that every politician has a personal story to tell you. Very rarely when you lobby politicians will they, will they let their guard down and tell you about their personal lives. But when you lobby them on this issue, they will open up to you and tell you about their parents' death, tell you about their own experience. In fact, I wrote to an MP recently and he replied to me and he said, I used to be in favour of assisted suicide, but when my, I experienced my mother's death recently, um, I have been reviewing my position. Um, so it's interesting how the personal really impacts the, the positions that the, the, the politicians take. And that's where good stories um, and good experience, particularly from doctors, um, can have a huge impact. Uh, we have a question. What are your thoughts on child euthanasia? Well, it's practiced in, in Belgium, as I said, it, the, there's not been a huge number of child euthanasia cases in Belgium. The Dutch um, government's considering it at the moment. But even if you support assisted suicide or euthanasia, and clearly we don't, but even if you support it on grounds of autonomy, questions have to be raised about euthanizing children or, or giving, giving su assisting suicide of children because children are not in a position to make an informed consent, to give informed consent. And we don't allow children to drink alcohol. We don't allow them to drive cars. We don't allow them to vote even um, until they're 16, 17, 18. But uh, there are proposals and there is practice where um, they can be killed. And that essentially means that you're giving autonomy to someone else, either the doctors or the parents. Um, and indeed, that's, that's one of the concerns that people like Kevin, you'll have about assisted suicide generally, that the autonomy is not actually given to the patient, the autonomy is given to the doctor. So I would say that even, even when um, we're engaging with those who argue for assisted suicide and euthanasia, child euthanasia should be a complete um, uh, prohibition. There was a question on conscience issues. I'm assuming that doesn't really apply to you, but you know, the fact of it is, is when you legalize euthanasia and assisted suicide, all these questions come up for, for grabs, such as conscience, for instance. Yeah, I mean, conscience is a big issue on all sorts of issues now in, in Western liberal societies. Um, and uh, clearly in, in Belgium, conscience is, is a, a matter of concern for those in, in hospices and care homes who with this new law um, are unable to prohibit um, a doctor coming onto the premises um, and conducting euthanasia. Um, and that, you know, for a, for a religious care home, for example, it goes against their ethos. So that I think it is a clash of individual rights versus the, the rights of association of, of groups that choose to run hospices and care homes. Um, you might want to comment right now because in Europe there is several places that are, it seems like uh, they're ready to legalize euthanasia, such as uh, Spain and Portugal. And, um, and of course, the situation in Germany is totally different, but nonetheless, you might want to comment on Spain and Portugal. Yeah, it's, all, it's all been happening very quickly in Spain and Portugal. It, it was debated a few years ago and, and it was rejected in those countries, but there's been a change of government. Um, uh, a more a socialist, socialist governments have come in. Now, it's interesting to me that because in the UK, the British Labour Party has always been um, quite strongly opposed. There have been a large number of people in the Labour Party, particularly last time round, who, although Rob Maris was a, a Labour MP, there were a large number of Labour MPs voted against um, the bill in the UK. Um, so this should not be a, an issue that, that is, where people divide along politically politically partisan lines, I think. And that's been one of the benefits that we've had in the UK that that's not been as pronounced as it has been in other jurisdictions. But that's what's essentially happened in Spain and Portugal to change the position. And certainly my colleagues that I liaise with in Spain um, and Portugal are very concerned about um, what's happening in those jurisdictions and that the legislation is likely to go through. But the other thing which I think is interesting that they've, is that they've just gone for euthanasia. They have not gone for assisted suicide um, and so we will see all the same problems that we've seen in the Belgium and in the Netherlands in those two countries as well and in Ireland as well for that matter. Are the German situations a little bit more unique though? Would you like to comment on the German situation? Yeah it was, it was a court that um, gave a, a ruling, same in Austria, 
that the, consti the, the constitution um, would um, does not prohibit, or, or you can't pass a law that would prohibit assisting suicide co uh, under the constitution. I, f I am deeply disturbed by courts intervening in essentially policy matters um, in this way. The same happened in Canada, obviously. It seems to me that the courts are overstepping their authority in doing so. Um, and there's a, there's a fundamental issue of democratic accountability, which is at stake here in any sort of Western liberal democratic society. So fortunately, the UK Supreme Court has not chosen to, to, to engage in this sort of judicial activism. The European Court of Human Rights has up until now always ruled that there is no right to um, access euthanasia or assisted suicide. You cannot interpret the right to life in those terms. And although on some occasions the right to a private family life might be engaged, um, most of the cases that have come before the courts in the UK and, and gone up to Strasbourg have been rejected. There's a question about organ donation uh, after euthanasia because there was a documentary in Canada in particular, and you know this is going on, of course, in Belgium and the Netherlands and Canada, uh, and I'm sure uh, um, it's being considered in other places, but there's, there was a documentary in CB, on the CBC in Canada about a woman with a degenerative neurological condition who was uh, terminal, not terminal. Anyway, she opted for euthanasia because she could donate her organs. Mm. I mean, clearly there, there is a, a huge concern about the potential for either people in, you know, applying internal pressure to themselves. There is a, psych, a psychology around um, organ donation. Uh, we had a debate in the Scottish Parliament uh, a year or two ago before I, I joined Care Not Killing. I was involved in this debate about um, a presumed consent for organ donation and about whether organ donation should be... Um, uh, whether whether the state had the authority to uh, presume consent. But th the key thing that came out of that in terms of the argument against, which came not just from ourselves, but also from, from professionals and others, was that organ donation is a gift and is seen as a gift. And so therefore it brings great, um, uh, great comfort to those family members um, often where they are, they are um, relative is dying um, because they can, you know, they, they feel that there's some good has come out of the situation. And so that's a very important aspect of organ donation. Um, and it seems to me that there is a danger in terms of this whole debate about euthanasia and assisted suicide, if you link it in with organ donation, um, that people's motivations, they might, you might be adding another pressure, another psychological pressure into the equation that, that, uh, that, that that the, the patient or the, the person who's asking for euthanasia or assisted suicide might be factoring into their, into their request. And obviously there's also then the issue as well, particularly uh, about whether there might be pressure applied to clinicians um, in certain cases um, because of the, the organ donation dimension to it. But it's probably better for somebody who knows about um, the practicalities of organ donation from a medical point of view to to comment on that specific point, I think. Thank you, Gordon. Similar to myself, this is this is the work that he does, and uh, and the fact that he's focused on uh, working with many many groups from different perspectives has been a, a very very effective for the Care Not Killing Alliance.